Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Ward Carroll, the Naval Institute's Director of Outreach and Marketing. Joining me for another history episode is the Naval History Editor-in-Chief, Eric Mills. Hello, Eric. The Wardster. How have you been? I've been well since we last convened here. You know, it dawns on me, I haven't seen you since last year. It's been that long? You haven't aged a day. I have. I have. Well, I've actually aged as we speak. <laughs> How many days is it now? I've aged 19 days. Um, oh, okay. But thank you for the compliment. I'm feeling good. Um, Happy 2022. Indeed. So today's topic is a great one. It's the cover story from the February issue of Naval History Magazine. So we were just talking with our guests, our guests before we came on air here. And uh, having grown up in the literals of North Carolina and our family owned a sailboat, we used to race along the Noose River and take for journeys through the waterways of Eastern North Carolina, including Cape Lookout. So when you say to me, Cape Lookout, I don't think war zone. Right. But in fact, in the years of World War II, it was a very active war zone and probably to the degree that most Americans don't realize these days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you go up and down the intercoastal waterway in the Atlantic coast, the mid-Atlantic beaches, you'll see these occasional um, bunker looking things, which were like U-boat lookout sites and uh, a testament to those dark days 80 years ago. We often forget about how close World War II came to our shore. We do. I mean, we, we conceive of it as something that happened over there, mm -hmm. with the exception of Pearl Harbor. Um, but this story particularly really does bring home how it was a domestic conflict in mm -hmm. this way particularly. So let's go ahead and bring in our guest. Sounds great. Well, we're happy to have with us today the author of our cover story and the current issue of Naval History. Get them today, kids, if you don't have yours yet. It's a Getting a lot of good feedback on this one. And a lot of that has to do with this cover story. Um, so our guest is Ed Offley. He's been a career military journalist for four decades now. He's the author of two books about the Battle of the Atlantic, Turning the Tide, How a Small Band of Allied Sailors Defeated the U-Boats and Won the Battle of the Atlantic, and more recently, The Burning Shore, How Hitler's U-Boats Brought World War II to America. And that's what we'll talk about today. Um, 80 years ago, this January, this began. Um, in Germany, they called it Paukenschlag. In English, we call it Operation Drumbeat. And what it was was Adolf Hitler's all-out assault on the American coastline from Nova Scotia all the way down the Atlantic coast to the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico with unleashing his U-boats to wreak all sorts of havoc. And as Ed will talk to us about here, um, and his story is titled thusly, the most intriguing thing about this is the Navy's uh, reaction to this. Um, and that's why this article is called The Drumboat Mystery. So I'll let that mystery be unveiled to you by our guest. Welcome, Ed. Great to have you here. Hi, Eric. Glad to be here. This was a fascinating topic for me long before I learned that there was a mystery to it. Um, I tripped over stories about the U-boats uh, during World War II. Uh, when I was a very young reporter in the 1970s uh, up in Virginia, and people would say, oh, did, there was a horrible thing happened here and there. And you go and try and find out details about it. And it turned out there weren't very many available because the, the whole archive of US Naval Intelligence and anti-submarine warfare and attacks on U-boats had not been declassified until nearly the end of the 1960s. And even then, the accounts were pretty well superficial and ignored some of the real issues that defined and marked the truth. Um, what I found out over the period of, of, of years writing about it was that there were some really, really nasty secrets buried in the archives. In fact, they weren't supposed to be in the archives because there was pretty, pretty clear uh, circumstantial, but pretty clear evidence that the archive at the end of World War II was very carefully laundered and, and selectively uh, cleansed by people in the Navy, in the senior uh, leadership. So you're left with what I call the elephant in the parking lot. You got a dead elephant in the parking lot. 
and you can't move it. So what you do is you paint it, you obscure it, you plant bushes around it, and hope to convince everybody that goes into the parking lot that there's not a dead elephant in the parking lot. And the dead elephant in this case was that uh, you read all the histories that came out, you know, in the 50s and 60s, some of the memoirs, uh, unofficial biographies of people like Admiral Ernest King and, and so on. And they sort of are a little discomforting when they discuss it. They say, oh, the U.S. was not prepared for the Battle of the Atlantic. And then they kind of mumble a little bit and then talk about how the correctives and, and strategies and, and equipment that they needed to, to counter the U-boats came online over a painful six, seven month period. That obscures a very nasty truth. And and I have to give credit to, a, a, I, he's not a colleague of mine, but I think of him as a comrade, a retired Naval historian, Michael Gannon, who also is, has covered this beat. Uh, he was researching in the, I think it was the mid to late eighties in the archive. And he was way down in the weeds somewhere, some local administrative history of some unit up in Canada or even Iceland. And he found what I thought was the most explosive document that it, I'd ever heard coming out of the World War II archives. And what it was, was this. Uh, two days after Pearl Harbor, Adolf Hitler, after months of resisting, told Admiral Car Carl Doenitz, commander of the U-boat force, you may now go attack the Americans in, in their coastal waters. And he rounded up um, a half dozen of his large Type 9 U-boats. These were the, the long range, uh, heavier uh, submersibles that he had. He had he had two essential types, the Type 7 and the Type 9. Um, and he sent them off, you know, to, to do a coordinated attack along the East Coast on a preset date of January the 14th, give him time to tiptoe across the Atlantic. Well, uh, there was one, one flaw in Doinitz's, um strategy, which he did not learn about until the mid 1970s in his dotage. And that was that the British had broken uh, the German naval codes uh, put out through the, what they called the Enigma uh, machine. Uh, this was supposedly a foolproof way to encrypt uh, radio messages that would then be broadcast on high frequency from U-boats at sea to headquarters and then vice uh, back again. And so when he started organizing uh, this attack on America, he, he picked one U-boat and said he wanted him to go out south of Iceland, travel in a circle, and broadcast like 24-7 faking messages from other U-boats so that if there was if there was any code or radio direction finding, uh, the Allies would think, oh, there's a whole huge group of U-boats out here south of Iceland. Well, the British at Bletchley Park, which is where their, their uh, code breakers were, uh, saw right through the, the ruse and, and immediately surmised um, the number and, and uh, direction and course and speed of the, the drumbeat U-boat force, which by now was a, uh, five of these uh, type uh, seven U boat, or I'm sorry, type nine U boats, and then a larger group of of type sevens that didn't have the range to get to the east coast, but were going to operate up off Newfoundland, which is keep about a thousand miles closer to base. So the British knew they were going, uh, and it didn't take much, uh, you know, intellectual brain power to figure out what they were going to do. I mean, you got a bunch of U boats heading towards a country that your country just declared war on. And so you can sort of say, I bet they're coming to attack our shipping. Well, here's what happened. Um, the British sent the warning to uh, Admiral King's headquarters in Washington. And a day or two later, uh, Comminch, his headquarters, sent an all hands message out to every Atlantic fleet unit from Iceland to Florida. And it listed a number of subs. It listed their latitude and longitude positions. And it said they're already here. And this message went out the day before the U-boats begin their assault on East Coast shipping. And the weird thing is that, you know, you would think, say, at Hawaii, if Admiral Kimmel had gotten a message specifying 
that the Japanese Imperial Navy was uh, 24, hours, 24 hours out from attacking Pearl Harbor, they might have gone on alert or sent some planes and ships out to try and intercept it. Uh, well, Admiral Kimmel did not know they were coming. They came. He got fired. Admiral King knew the Germans were coming. He did nothing. And he did not get fired. Uh, and they managed to suppress this secret for nearly uh, 40 years uh, after it happened. But what happened was very simple, and it was pretty horrible. They knew the Germans were coming. They knew how many U-boats were going to be in the first wave. They knew their latitude and longitude positions. Worse ever, they had a force of 13 combat-ready Atlantic Fleet destroyers converging on New York Harbor and uh, several bases up the coastline toward Maine. And their function at that time was to prepare an escort for a troop ship convoy that was scheduled to depart New York on January 15th, 1942. And they were going to take these ships with 4,000 or so army soldiers on board and take them up to Iceland and the other half to Northern Ireland as a political public relations show that the U.S. had entered the war on the side of the Allies. Uh, we were steaming overseas to engage Nazi Germany in the fight, which is fine. Uh, I, I think that was one of the top priorities that Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt uh, came to have uh, during this uh, conference in Washington. It was still going on at the time the U-boats came ashore. Uh, the only problem was, in doing so, he left the Atlantic coast wide open to a massacre of commercial shipping that started on January uh, 13th, 14th, and continued for six months. Yeah, it's really shocking to see the um, smoking gun message traffic, which, as you point out, didn't wasn't made clear like decades later. But nonetheless, uh, yeah, um, they had foreknowledge of this five weeks earlier. Um, we had had no foreknowledge in Pearl, and now we had all the foreknowledge you could possibly need, yet we did nothing. Um, you quote historian Michael Gann in, in the piece. He, he, he was rather um, savage in his assessment, as you put out. Perhaps no more telling attack warning in unmistakable language and numbers had ever come to the military forces of the United States, and yet the U.S. Navy still did nothing. Thus the mystery of the drumboat mystery. Um, where do you come down on that? I mean, it's a rhetorical question. Um, clearly, it's the Germany first policy, but I mean, you got the destroyers right there, and uh, they could have waited <laughs> to send the convoy. I, I make no potential threat strategy, but you think they could have just said, well, "Look, let the convoy hold on for a week or two and go out there and disrupt the attack." I mean, that's just basic common sense. And I looked in vain. Uh, my researchers looked in vain. I read every book I could find on it. And Ernie King and his aides are so silent on it that it just, the silence is deafening. There was no, oh yeah, there was a debate over this and that. In his official reports to the Secretary of the Navy on the war, nothing. In his authorized biography, nothing. Uh, even some of the administrative histories there is one reference in the what they call the Eastern Sea Frontier. This was the shore base command um, headed by Augustus Adolphus Andrews, who was a classmate of King's at the Naval Academy. Their job was coastal defense, harbor nets, uh, de you know, defensive minefields, and later on uh, patrols off the coast. But he didn't have any ships or planes, so right now that was an academic. And his command history, six months after the, the catastrophe, uh, the official diary said, yeah, we had an advance warning, but uh, didn't do anything about it, blah, blah, blah. It was, it was pretty horrific. Uh, Pearl Harbor cost us about 2,300 um, people killed, most 90% of them, 99% of them military. Uh, the U-boats, in the six months that this campaign went on, uh, they were able to mount 354 separate U-boat patrols to the United States, either to Canada, or Newfoundland, the New England area, 
uh, mid-Atlantic, and then later down towards Florida, and then into the Gulf of Mexico and Caribbean. Uh, 114 U-boats carried this out over a six-month period. They're always, uh, I did a graph, uh, a text uh, Excel run on it once, and usually there are anywhere between five and seven U-boats operating off the coast at any one time, but it went on 24-7 without cease. So it added up three or four ships a day uh, over six months. You, you, you get the total, which is nearly 500 uh, allied and American merchant freighters, uh, tankers, uh, pa passenger liners uh, went to the bottom of the Atlantic. And it killed nearly three times as many people as Pearl Harbor. Only they weren't just, you know, aircraft mechanics or, you know, yeoman or clerks. These were valuable, rare, because there were shortages, merchant, mariner, seamen who crewed the ships that had to take the arsenal of democracy to our allies in, in the British Isles. And they went down, you know, just like flies. It was, it was, it was a horrific loss. And I make no pretensions that King had any, you know, nefarious or bad intent. I think just in the absence of any information, knowing the what, that we knew they were coming, we had the means to stop them, but we didn't, was it? And I say this without a direct evidentiary link, but the logical thing is uh, Franklin Roosevelt told him that troop ship convoy has got to go hell or high water. It's the only thing that makes sense is that he was directed to do it and then the details uh, were later, you know, deleted from the files. But thanks to Mike Gannon, we found really the smoking howitzer of, of this whole thing. <laughs> well put. Yeah, his book, uh, Drumbeat, came out, what, around 1990 or thereabouts? And you really rewrote yeah. the history of this, if, or if anything, it launched the history of this, if you will. A good example of how history is um, never all the way finished, I think. Um, there's still more to know about this. The, the mystery remains a mystery. Though I agree with you, it sounds like it clearly was a political thing that came from on high. Uh, well, was there a was there a publicity element as well? So, you know, obviously a Pearl Harbor, a publicity element. Like, you know, Pearl Harbor was obviously very well covered in the media, um, and this Operation Drumbeat took place over a number of months. So that tally that ultimately eclipsed the casualty tally of Pearl Harbor, took some, it wasn't a single day kind of a thing. Um, well, let me tell you about Pearl Harbor and publicity. Um, you go back and read anything from Gordon Prang to, to, to any of the other historians, and, and the first rough draft of that history in newspapers was pretty damn rough. I have a, a copy of the front page of my newspaper I worked for in Seattle, the Post Intelligencer. I was a military writer up there for about 13 years. And I had, I used to keep on my bulletin board a, a huge blow copy of the front page of the Seattle Post Intelligencer on December 8th, 1941. And the banner headline read, US Raids Jap Fleet. And you go, oops. Well, what happened was the AP or UPI reporter, I can't remember which one, was up on a hillside. I think it was probably after the first wave of, of uh, the uh, aircraft had come and gone. And he saw way off in the horizon, a solitary American destroyer banging away with his six inch gun. Now what the destroyer was shooting at, uh, you, you got me because the Kido Butai was 200 miles north of Oahu, and this guy was heading south from the Harbor Channel. So this reporter sees all the chaos below, battleships turned over, and he sees this one lone little gray warship going bang, bang, bang. And he conflates that into, you know, the Battle of Jutland. And that made the front page of our paper because about, within minutes of him filing his first bulletin, somebody took a fire axe and cut the cable to the mainland. And every other piece of information about Pearl Harbor that we know know today was deemed top secret and and not did not come out until the, after the war had ended. So, so very, very there wasn't massive 
publicity headlines day that will live in infamy that sort of dynamic where there was the demand for let's just call husband Kimmel a scapegoat um, again I'm trying to contrast that with drumbeat and sort of figure out how did King manage to escape this outcome where Kimmel, you know, I mean, his family's still fighting to clear his name. You know, the NHHC just did a, a panel on Pearl Harbor day about, you know, can we finally at long last let Admiral Kimmel off the hook and Naval Institute likes to deify Admiral King, you know, uh, because he's a general prize essay contest winner and so forth and so on. Um, until I read your article, I had no idea that he was culpable of this sort of professional negligence, right? So again, to put, to repeat Eric's question, how did he get away with it? Is it because of the FDR piece where FDR is like, okay, I need this convoy. I get it that we're totally exposing the East Coast, but I got you covered. Is it, was that it? Is that how that that, that makes out? a certain amount of logic? But I I declined to try and speculate in my article because I could write an article three times as long on all the what ifs. Obviously, in reading about King, I, I learned a couple of things. One, he detested the Office of Naval Intelligence. He thought of them as a bunch of of, of, of shore-based geeks that spent all day putting pins and maps of where all the ships were. Um, one of the very first things he did when he came in as, as and replaced uh, Admiral Stark was there was a, a rear admiral, I forget his name, who was uh, director of the Office of Naval Intelligence. And one of the first things King did was he said, you've got uh, two hours to get out of the building, you're fired. And he replaced him with a some other junior officer, maybe a captain, I'm, I'm a little hazier, just talking about it, who had no background in intelligence whatsoever. Uh, and the second thing I learned, and this is this is just stuff to consider, uh, there was a staff officer who ran the operational section for King named Richmond Kelly Turner, who went on to have a brilliant career in charge of most of the major amphibious landings in the Pacific, like Iwo Jima or... or you know, things like that. But when he was the operations officer, he went in and plundered ONI. Uh, he berated the people. He, he took their raw data and made his own uh, intelligence estimates, which frequently were just completely haywire. And there he was involved in, and in, in I'm sure Naval History Magazine and the Institute have written about this, this long running contention over uh, people in D.C. and people out in Hawaii and who got credit for breaking the Japanese naval codes. And um, there was a bureaucratic knife fight that was not very uh, positive for the Navy's reputation. Uh, and in the process, the people who did the job on finding out what the enemy was doing essentially got the shaft, like Joe Rochefort did not get his Distinguished Service uh, Medal until, you know, 50 years after he died. Um, so those were some of the factors going on. And, and King admitted candidly, one thing in his memoirs is that when he showed up at, 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 the, at the Navy main headquarters, it was only 11 days before the U-boat attack. And he said that we had nothing. He had no staff. He didn't even have a desk. He had to steal a table somewhere, put in this empty office that became his desk. So if there was a dirty verdict, he had a lot of extenuation and mitigation uh, to say, OK, we were flat footed, but, you know, we were in chaos and the war just started and we're not doing too well. Nonetheless, the fact that they went to such obviously careful steps to delete any reference to this tells me that there was a guilty conscience there somewhere. Well, the, the name Richmond Kelly Turner, I'm just going to say, would be a great pop country star. That's <laughs> a, a real good name for us. Well, he, he made a great in, invader of islands, too. I'm checking here. I'm pretty sure we have his oral history. Um, you know, if it's the FDR political publicity thing and the Germany thirst thing, it kind of comes back to Churchill a little bit, too. I mean, 
like you said, these guys were still in their conference. I mean, Churchill had come to the White House that December of 41 and essentially just camped out. He had a slumber party there, and they just discussed the whole grand strategy, Germany first, which means Britain first, right? Um, you know, if he'd been drinking the Winston Churchill Kool-Aid for a few weeks there, and he, you can kind of see his hand in that too. I mean, he wanted to make it really, really clear that it's Germany first, then this convoy with the troops was an important uh, optic, if you will. I mean, again, this is all just hypothesis, but it kind well, of- Well, I make no argument against that. I, I, I very well see that it was vital to, to keep Joseph Stalin uh, thinking that he wasn't fighting the Germans alone. I mean, that, the, one of the great fears uh, throughout the conference and in early 42 is they're afraid Joe Stalin might go and cut a separate deal with Hitler and, and, and free the German army to come back into Western Europe. Um, I have no brook with that. I, I think they are presented with two imperatives and one set of destroyers, and it didn't occur to them they could sequence it. Um, if, if there is a flaw in what I have presented in the sense of, oh, no, there were other factors, uh, I'd be well, I'd be real, very happy to see it because I couldn't find it. Uh, mm -hmm. They knew they were coming. They had the ships. They had the convoy scheduled. They made their decision. So and we had to live with it. Yeah. I mean, sending those destroyers out, I'm not, they, they wouldn't have stopped uh, doing this assault, but it sure would have tangled it up and probably saved a bunch of ships and a bunch of lives. Right. I mean, if they could have thwarted it at the get-go, they can halt the momentum of a six-month brutal campaign by sort of kneecapping it at the start. Um, and those troops that were going over there, they weren't vital to the war effort in Europe necessarily. No, they're, they're I mean, right about one thing. It was a publicity stunt. Yeah. They were going to Iceland, you know, a dagger in Ireland. the heart of the North Pole. I mean, Well, again, I, I'm... Maybe it's through the lens of our current social media morass and the fact that there are no secrets. And I don't know, as shipping is going down and crew members are being killed and families are being robbed of their loved ones on a daily basis off the coast of, you know, the East Coast and the Gulf. I don't know how there's not some outcry for defense of our shipping and i get it that it was a choice that they made uh, it wasn't so much that they that they chose to do nothing to counter the threat of these u-boats it was that they chose to dedicate all their assets to the convoy to make nice with with churchill uh, and it wasn't just that convoy by the way um once the convoy got over to northern ireland and the destroyers came back they continued to ferry troop ships there was a separate uh, pipeline slow at first and increasing over time where the bulk of the Atlantic fleets destroyers who are not involved in the in the North Atlantic convoy runs up around Iceland most of the destroyers that were left were, were, were assigned to the task forces to take troop ships and that that makes a certain amount of sense too I have to tell you one of the discoveries I made of a personal nature thinking I you know knew everything but I didn't uh, I discovered just three months ago uh, that my father had a first cousin. Uh, it was a branch of the family that over generations had sort of drifted away from my family. But he was my, my grandmother's nephew. And he was from Brooklyn, New York. He enlisted in the Army. He was a sergeant in this one uh, follow-up division going into Normandy uh, Christmas Eve of 44. And his troop ship, the Leopoldville, was torpedoed, and he went down with along 800 other soldiers. Um, I suddenly realized, you know, this is not an academic story after all. It actually uh, touched my family, even though perhaps I was a thick-headed young kid who wasn't listening when my parents reminisced. But uh, first cousin, your father is not far away. No, Go it through. absolutely isn't. So again, was the public unaware of? the scourge of U-boats. Um, There's a line yeah. in, in, in my book. I, I, I don't want to break the video feed and look for it. So I'll paraphrase. Frank Knox, God bless him, he's a newspaper publisher, so he was probably half nuts of Star Wars, put out a, a, a statement around March or April of 42. 
And he said, we want to praise, this is, I'm paraphrasing, we want to praise the press for being true patriots, for not disclosing any details of the ongoing battle with the, with the German submarine force. And he said, we want to make sure that all citizens take part. And he actually said, if you happen to see a U-boat, or you would even being captured, don't tell anyone about it. Keep it to yourself, and that way you'll help the war effort. And in an earlier uh, statement, this was a couple of weeks earlier, uh, he, he said, the number of U-boats making round trips is, is uh, I'm glad to say, is decreasing. And uh, the number of U-boats making one-way trips to America is on the rise. And it went on and on for a couple of paragraphs in that vein. And you look at the chronological record, and at the time, we had yet to sink a single U-boat. So they were using uh, wartime censorship and uh, smoke mirrors and um, lies to cloak the fact that uh, they're getting routed. And perhaps you have to do that. You know, I've never seen courses on military leadership in a losing cause. Maybe, maybe they're going to be teaching that uh, in the future, I don't know. But they had a bad set of cards and they played it as well as they could. And unfortunately, the truth had nothing to do with any of it. Well, so again, that petition that if you see something, say nothing. I, I'm not sure we could carry that out these days, right? Well, I remember that year ended uh, about 20, uh, 20, almost 20, almost 30 years ago this year. I was, uh, I could just take a, a vignette. I was uh, enjoying a day off in December of 1992. Uh, it was a real snowy, wet, slushy day in Seattle. So I found a, a sports bar that was open. It had a nice Irish coffee in my hand. It was sitting here watching some sports program wrapping up uh, the NFL playoffs. And suddenly the screen went totally black, a little green flex in it. And a CNN live bulletin came on, breaking news. And an uh, image cleared up and you saw waves on a beach. And all of a sudden you saw these two guys wriggling ashore on their, on their bellies. And then two more. And then this huge Marine Amtrak vehicle comes roaring by. And this goes on for about 15 or 20 minutes. And suddenly the camera lights, the white lights come on. And there's this Navy SEAL looking like Vice President Quayle, deer in the headlights. And the CNN reporter is going, how does it feel to have invaded Somalia? And I said, oh, God, the, the, the you know, we're in it now for the full 24-7 news cycle. And the interesting footnote, <clears throat> excuse me, is that uh, 48 hours later, I was standing on that beach. Uh, I got a call that day saying, how would you like to fly with the Air Force uh, to uh, Mogadishu? And I said, I would love to. So, yeah, the, the era of loose lip, lip sync ships uh, has got to, got to deal with a lot of social media. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't want to paint with too broad a brush. I know and have seen press sit on something for, you know, if you embargo something, um, they will generally honor that, you know, although it's obviously very competitive and they're the proliferation of news outlets and media since World War II is, you know, astronomical. But I don't want to say that journalists, and that you know this as a journalist, don't have a patriotic spirit at its core. I remember asking, and this was what, in 1998, I went to a lecture when I was on the staff at the Naval Academy with Jamie McIntyre when Jamie worked at CNN. And I remember asking him, does CNN have an American soul? And that that question just kind of like, he wasn't quite sure, but he said, yes, at the end of the day, we are an American company founded by a great American Ted Turner and dot, dot, dot. Um, but we still have a journalistic responsibility that, that sometimes eclipses that sense. But if there's something that is going to hazard the troops and you can prima facie, you know, acknowledge that, then we will do what needs to be done while still trying to carry out our mission in a very competitive 
environment, right? So, but if you go to the American people, you're like, hey, there's some crazy stuff going on, you know, out there in the Atlantic. Um, so if you're out there, you know, sport fishing or whatever, and you see a UFO or UFO, when you see a U-boat, um, don't say anything. Just just keep your mouth shut. I just don't see, I mean, already people have got their phones off and they're live streaming to Twitter and Facebook and et cetera, et cetera. Well, well look at the front pages today. They're showing these satellite images of, of Putin's army buildup of, in, 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 by Ukraine. I remember yeah. in 1984, 85, sometime back, a guy named Samuel Morrison, a nephew of the great historian, went to prison for two years because he leaked one of those pictures showing a Russian, I think, a Soviet naval shipyard. Um, the transparent world is, is a reality. And one of the impacts that I always like to tell people <clears throat> is I, I, I did kind of come a full circle. I used to say I went to Vietnam in the Navy and I came home and everybody hated me. And then I grew up and I went to the Persian Gulf War for Desert Storm as a reporter and I came home and everybody hated me. So I feel like I've done it all. <laughs> <laughs> so how long did Drumbeat last and how did it neck down and finally end? Technically, officially, this is just a little footnote. Doinitz's reference to Drumbeat was actually just the first wave of, of the assault that, that broke out on uh, mid-January. Uh, but he, he ended up he ended up continuously streaming U-boats uh, through the uh, mid-July. Uh, there were 114 U-boats who took part. Uh, they compiled 354 patrols. That's East Coast, Gulf of Mexico, Caribbean. Um, the, the vast majority of them only did one patrol. And for one reason or another, uh, never came back because there were other missions like up by Norway. Uh, some of them got sunk on their first patrol. Uh, the second largest number made two. <clears throat> For instance, U-123, uh, Reinhard Hardigan's uh, boat that kicked off the offense with the torpedoing of the Cyclops in the Nornis actually a day early. He actually made two patrols. He made one, went back to France, went through overhaul training and, and came back, I think in May and, and almost got sunk. Uh, a handful also did three, but it was, this is like the luck of the railroad schedule more than anything else. Uh, Doinitz by that time had enough U-boats to keep them coming. Uh, but what happened was, <clears throat> excuse me, I love, my favorite Churchill quote is, you can always trust the Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. And that's sort of what happened. Uh, by April and May of 42, uh, Ingersoll at the Atlantic Fleet and King in Washington finally managed to scrape up enough escorts to put together what they call a bucket brigade convoy system. And this was where ships would actually dash from harbor to harbor, uh, you know, like from Florida to Charleston to Cape Lookout or, or Onslow Bay to Chesapeake Bay to the Delaware Bay, to New York, uh, hiding by night behind uh, torpedo fences. Finally, in, in May, uh, by mid-May, there was a convoy system in place. Um, and as soon as that happened, uh, sinkings just dropped a nil, practically. And Doinitz read the tea leaves. He lost two U-boats within a week off of Hatteras, in July of 42, and that, at that point he said, okay, this phase of the campaign is over, and he withdrew the force. But he set the stage for the actual real real fight that took place in the fall of 42 and the winter of 43. That's when the Allies did come close to, to, to being uh, defeated by the U-boats, which is another story. So the article is the Drumbeat Mystery. It is in the February issue of... Naval History Magazine. The author is Ed Offley. Ed, thanks for coming by the Proceedings Podcast today. My pleasure. Great to see you, Ed. Thank you. Okay, I'll send you a memo. All right, great conversation about a great topic. Eric, once again, a winner going by you. Um, so I don't know what our next episode is. What do we have coming up? Well, 
Um, we're still trying to get it scheduled, so I hesitate to be too specific. But there's some other good material in this article, and we're trying to get that onto the podcast to get it to a wider audience. Um, more to come on that very soon. Also, stay tuned for the next issue, the uh, March-April issue. Uh, going to be a lot of good content in there from the Falkland Islands War 40th anniversary to the centennial of the first U.S. aircraft carrier. Ooh. A heavy hitter. Yes, so, yes. Folks. The USS Langley. I can yeah, All right. be good stuff. All right. Well, until then, there we go. Thus, we got the term flat top, mm -hmm. right? Before islands were a thing. Um, so, this and every podcast is brought to you by the membership of the Naval Institute. For more, check out usni.org. And as always, Victory begins at the Naval Institute. We look forward to talking to you guys again soon. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. See you next time.